Welcome back to Soul Listens. I'm Evan Hirsch, and we have a very, very special guest with us today, who we've flown in all the way from Venus, Florida, to be here for the launch of our new documentary, A World Worth Imagining, Jock Fresco, The Man with the Plan, which is a documentary that features the last interview of Jock Fresco's life that we did out in Venus, Florida, and gives an introduction to the Venus Project and the resource-based economy, and just a hint at some of the massive brilliant, beautiful ideas that Jock and Roxanne have developed through the course of the decades that they were together. Such a pleasure to have you join us here in California, Roxanne. Oh, it's really my honor. It's been so wonderful. Yeah. So uh, we have a whole bunch to cover. We want to jump right in and um, <laughs> pick your brain a bit and help our viewers and anyone who happens across this video to go a little deeper and learn a little more. Uh, a lot of these questions come from people's concerns that I've heard over the time that I've been presenting the Venus Project to people. And also in terms of, and we're going to start with this, is where at Soul we are all about the love paradigm and consciousness shifting, expanding our consciousness and uh, shifting our thinking. And for us, really that's a big part of finding that new way is that foundational shift. And I know with, with the Venus Project, it's about recognizing our programming, our conditioning, that it comes from environment, that that shapes our behavior, it shapes our thinking, for better or worse, worse in many cases. And so um, we're often talking about the same things and maybe just a slightly different language to it. And so we wanna get some clarity and, and really find out how much on the same page we really are. So at Soul Documentary, we're really into the concept of love for many reasons. And um, I, when I was in Venus, I read our Love Paradigm Manifesto to Jock. It's available on our website. And he nodded in agreement after hearing, like every sentence he would nod. And But it, whenever I read the word love, he would correct me and say, extensionality. <laughs> so again, it's a lot semantics, it's the wording. Uh, why was he so opposed to the word love? And why is extensionality such a better word? Is there a place for love in the Venus Project? Well, I guess you'd say we're more into defining our terms. And the word love has many different meanings. You have one meaning in your manifesto, but people use that word and banter it around a lot and it ends up not having too much meaning after a while and especially by the people who are using that word the behavior doesn't manifest that a lot of times um, for instance what I mean by that is if you have a mother who constantly hugs the child and kisses it and says I love you and who loves you more than anybody mommy and daddy and that's nothing to show that but if you have another woman who um, never uses that word, <laughs> but is there to help the child all the time, helps them with the homework, helps them if they fall out of a tree, helps them learn how to swim and catches them when they need it, that child would feel very secure and the other one wouldn't. So it's not so much the word that's important. The word extensionality to Jacques meant something else. Um, yeah, tell us about that. Yeah. For instance, you know, being able to manifest it, as I said, in terms of um, if you do something, if, if you build a house with somebody, you, if you build it alone, it takes a long time. If, you, if the neighborhood helps you, then that the neighborhood or those people that help are extensional to you to extend your needs, extend your life, and um, to improve it. And if you have a whole community that does that, then it's that much better. Mm -hmm. If you work with somebody, an architect works with an engineer, they work as a team to do something that helps other people. When it's related more so to your own life, or one person, say, that you try and, and have extensionality with, it's more how Jacques used it, it's more 
uh, but genuine extensionality when it helps many different people. So, um, for instance, if somebody works on cleaning water, it helps the whole community. If somebody works on a vaccine to get rid of polio, it helps the person, but it also helps the community so they won't get it either. Um, so, it, when, when a bank lends you money, they do it, there's a toll to be paid. You, you have debt and you have obligations. So that's not real extensionality. And if we have a culture that's more extensional to one another in the real terms, then it's more of an advanced culture. Um, and it will enable us to become more civilized. If we know the difference between just using a word that might be manipulative, and it is manipulative today in the culture, Somebody says, I love you. A guy says, I love you to a girl. What does that mean? What does he, he want from her? That's right. Do <laughs> they want to get laid? Does he care about them? Do they want to share ideas? Mm -hmm. Does he want to help her become more independent and, and more self-sufficient? You know, then I'd say it's extensional. Yeah, it sounds more like what I would call love, but that's yeah. why you're saying extensional. Yeah. Because it extends the reach and capacity of what she's therefore capable of. Yes. And he's extending himself to her to help bolster and support that. Right, and Jack always used the term too, is that your arms are extensional devices for the body, your eyes, your ears, you know. If you lose that, it, it, it's hurtful to the whole body. I don't know if that helps a little bit with his definition. He really talking about manifesting a certain behavior so everybody improves. Mm. And that's really what it's about with Jack's Wisdom, is helping inspire this manifestation of behavior that serves us and each other. Yeah. And that's the extension, our extension, extensional to each other. Like you said, the, uh, we can be each other's eyes and ears and arms. That's a nice way to say it, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, many people are, speaking of words, many people are conditioned to believe certain things about trigger words. So, um... Whereas Jock was maybe triggered by the word love, wait, wait, love, hold on. Mm -hmm. Other people are triggered by words that they would associate with what they are assuming the Venus Project to be about. Cultism, is it a cult? Is it communism, etc. So how is the Venus Project different from communism, socialism? How is it not a cult? What, what makes it different from the cult? Um, if you look at the definition of a cult, and I can't remember it entirely, um, it talks about religious, spiritualism, philosophical, or group of people that advocate something um, that's different, or um, I don't know if it's a following a particular or person or something like that. But would that mean that um, that philosophy was a cult or? Um, architecture was a cult, or, um, you know, academia is a cult, it, it, it really has no real definition. Even sociology can't pinpoint, they can't agree on a real definition for a cult. So when they banty that word around, I, I don't know what they're talking about. Sometimes people might think it's a cult because we, um, it's based on somebody's life's work. But, you know, when the Wright brothers first flew, people went to the Wright brothers when they were interested in learning about flight. Is that a cult? And when the um, motor industry, when Ford came up with the automobile, as he did, then people went to him to learn. And he was the foremost uh, knowledge base for learning about automobiles. So I think we are at that stage right now. I don't know anybody else who came up with these ideas and synthesized them and brought so many different disciplines together to arrive at a resource-based economy and like how that jock. works in many different ways. Yeah. And so you're, you're comparing where it's as if we're coming to Jock in the way that people came to Ford. He was the expert on the subject. You, you want to learn how to build a car. Go to right. Ford. You want to learn how to create a society that actually serves us and is sustainable and elevates everyone to a high standard of living. Jock, he's the man with that wisdom. Right, and, and, 
and he never, it, it was funny too because, you know, his wisdom came from a lot of other people. I mean, he always had the book list out there. He always referred to where he learned certain things. And, and then he experimented on his own and put his theories to test as well in the real world. And when people come to him and say, um, you know, what should I do or what should I study or how can I help the Venus Project? And he would say, well, what do you know? Um, he would say, go back to school and take something in the physical sciences. So again, is physics a cult or is architecture a cult? And, and he would always, you know, talk about engineering. Is that a cult? to learn about that, and he would always say things like, don't make a statue to me, because that holds people back. And he would talk about how his cities, if the city became a reality, it would be a straitjacket for the next generation. They would come up with their own cities with better technology, better materials, and many other things, depending on where technology was at the time. And it sounds like this leads right into the, the, the people's fear that the Venus Project is advocating for something that's communism or socialism. And even in the film, Jock says that this is not, it's, it's a resource management government. Yeah. That just the government is there to employ that allocation, that, that, that usage of resources. Again, to benefit all to a high standard of living. Right. So, I mean, how, how, what, what do we tell people? How does that differ from communism? Well, um, people do throw that at you because it's like a red flag word, you know, communism, utopia, socialism. Um, but even if you ask them, well, what is communism? They don't know. They don't know. And what are you afraid of? They don't yeah. know. Losing their freedom. It's always yeah. losing their freedom. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't really have any freedom if you look at this country, too, in, in a lot of ways. Um, we always say you're as free as your purchasing power. Yeah. So, um, communism, first of all, they advocate a forceful or violent overthrow. The Venus Project does not at all. It really advocates deliberate evolution. So, communism in the manifesto advocates a, a forceful or violent overthrow, and the Venus Project doesn't do that at all. It really talks about a deliberate evolution by engineering and developing a process for a resource-based economy and putting that to test and collecting data and not doing it over a broad area, but slowly work that up and, and scaling up. So um, another major thing about communism is that they think that the proletariat, the, the proletariat or the working class should run things and over overthrow the wealthy but and they they say that it is um, the class struggle is the problem throughout history but we feel and I think it's more known now that the real problem is the mismanagement of resources under scarce conditions because the wealthy and the poor are the byproduct of that circumstance. So we try and talk about producing abundance and how that would be mani managed and um, how you make things available and accessible to people. So it's really not communism. And we talk about how to manage on a large scale through production, distribution, uh, how total city systems would be different, how we arrive at the needs of people by surveying. And so it's based on, on understanding the real world and what we have and based on a systems approach to managing things so we deliberately know what we're doing <laughs> and accounting for all as many variables as we can and resources. So it's quite different in a lot of ways. Yeah, it really is. It, it's really, again, it just comes back to really providing for people, elevating everyone to a high standard of living. And I think in these communism, socialism environments that have existed in the world, everyone's been oppressed and they've had their rights and their um, privileges taken away and their comforts. And, the, right. and, the, and that's, and there was that's why everyone's afraid of it, I think. And there was and elitism. Yeah. yeah. 
just like in this country, there was elitism and there was banks and there was military and there was police and we talk about how to make a society where we can surpass those needs. Evolve beyond them. Yeah. Exactly. You're saying deliberate evolution, we say conscious evolution. Again, maybe just semantics and, and the concepts are really quite quite similar, if not identical. Mm -hmm. that's right. So that's good. Um, you clearly have a broad curriculum for educating people uh, and um, about the culture and the value system of the Venus Project, such as collaboration versus competition, the resource-based economy model, and reconditioning away from the capitalist system. Um, the programming that we already re received to believe that that works for us and that that's the only way free market and libertarians so how how would your new way your new um, conditioning your new education uh, and the mindset be taught and implemented how, how is that cultural transition handled well we're doing all we can right now in terms of we think that media has has a a big approach with has the best approach with that and Jack always talked about wanting to do a, a movie and we have kind of expanded and grown into transmedia projects so it includes a lot of different media and we are continuing with that and that's vitally important so you know you don't just somebody gets up and lectures that you transmedia is based on world building and the world would be based on what Jock had talked about and new things that we learned after that, science and technology. Um, so people will see what they're missing. What it, I think it's the best way other than books or lectures or so people can just, as I mentioned, step into the future and walk out of there and say, I would like to see that happen because they know nothing else people aren't given options to understand that there's something other than communism, socialism, free enterprise system, fascism. So we have to show that, what it could be like for them. So this is more kind of Center for Resource Management, Museum of the Future type um, yes. implementation where you're teaching people now what, what you have in mind. How about like the transition of it coming into, say, a, a, a city within the Venus Project? And I mean, is there a a whole different education system right now. We have the K through 12 and you're indoctrinated into the American way or the Indian way or the British way. Um, is, do you have a similar program like that in mind where you're brought into the Venus Project way? Well, all cultures teach kids how to honor that culture. How else could they get them to go to war? You know, all kids are given the values that perpetuate whatever country that they're raised in. and they don't even know it, but the control is so subtle, we don't feel the manipulation after a while. And we think that it comes from us, but it doesn't. Everything that we learn comes from the outside. And so, just like any other culture in that way, except what we teach is very different, is we would teach how to perpetuate a resource-based economy, which means learning the sciences, learning how we can get clean sources of energy, how we can clean up the mess that we've done today, how we can develop efficient cities that can go up quickly so we can house, feed, and clothe everyone on Earth as quickly as possible. So what we would teach in, within the Venus Project would be the problems that we have today and how to solve them, not how to make a buck, how to abuse another person so you can make a buck faster, nothing to do with business or banking or advertising or stockbroking, stockbrokers, because um, you don't have money anymore within that system eventually. So those, those professions would be surpassed. They're really kind of vulture um, professions, mm -hmm. really, because they don't serve the interests of everybody. Mm. And uh, Jock, one thing I love that he said is, with, with the technology that we have and with the concepts he's putting forward, we can elevate every person on the planet to a high standard of living, a comfortable, have all your needs met, and creature comfort yes. standard of living in 10 years. We've never put that 
to scientists. Right. We've never gone to scientists and say, how do you develop a society without any booms and busts, with clean sources of energy, with efficient housing for everyone, and medical care from birth to death? How, you know, from scratch, if you had to think about it, how would you do that? Mm. So we use our resources, our technology, so we don't hurt one another. We've just never turned to scientists and given them that problem. And it would be scientists we would have to go to because our problems today are, are really technical. They're not philosophical. They're not religious. They've tried that. It doesn't work on a moral stance. They're, um, they're, they're technical. Everything that you have primarily, your, your windows, your refrigeration, your heating, your energy systems, they're all technical, mm -hmm. but they don't work for us. They work for very few people who reap the benefits or the money um, from those systems. And so ultimately it works against everybody. Yeah, this is one thing I love about the Venus Project is this completely different approach, looking at things through a different lens, coming from a different angle, with a different value system at its core and a different end result in mind. Yeah. So, um, so what about leadership? Is there leadership within the Venus Project and how are they selected? How do you assure they align fully with all the values of Jock's vision and that they're effective leaders? Uh, you've been alongside him for many decades as his surviving partner. Does that make you the automatic leader now? And mm -hmm. is, his, is his vision allowed to evolve over time? You know, or is it just the ultimate authority? That never, I never felt like Jock was on some pedestal and the, 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 no. the Chairman Mao, that image that's everywhere. <laughs> no, he, he wouldn't want that. He was yeah. just to say, I'm just like everybody else, yeah. you know what I mean? I'm I not, just had a different background. Anybody yeah. can learn how to draw, anybody can learn engineering, and yeah. you know, we can all do that in a different environment, which enables us to do that. There's no privileged people. Um, that's when you run into, into problems. So, um, but what about actual leader? I mean, we, 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 someone needs to tell us, okay, where do I be? What do I, how do we do this? Um, it, what about like well, a hierarchy or a structure there? Is that no, they're, they're planned for? Or what, what, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, um, if you're talking about within a resource-based economy, people, what, what determines decision-making are our needs, which means we would have to take a survey of the globe to know what we have. You know, if somebody said, I want to make um, stainless steel roofs on all the houses, well, do we have that? What should it be used for ultimately, really? We have to survey, take a lot of data, make a lot of, arrive at a lot of data, and um, the survey would determine where our resources are, what we have, where the water is, where the arable land is, where, what are the people's needs? Um, what are the dangers in different areas? You know, like a fault line, we wouldn't want to build cities on the fault lines. Or, um, or how do we build in relation to hurricanes? And what are, the, what are the winds? And what do materials, what can they withstand? So um, it's really based on the methods of science applied to the way we live. Uh, the decisions would be, you know, if you want to build a bridge, if, if the survey people said we need a bridge from here to there to, um, to transport different materials, then we would go to those who have experience in bridge building. We wouldn't go to a baker. If you need your appendix out, you don't want to take a vote in the neighborhood and see which one that people you know, which doctor or even who should do it. Um, so it's really based, a knowledge base, on getting many different disciplines together who are professional in different areas to make the decisions in those areas. Uh, it's not based on opinions, but based on data. You know, if you walk into an airplane, you don't walk up to the pilot and tell them the ground speed needed for takeoff that's based on many different test flights under various weather conditions and other conditions. It's not the opinion. We're not interested in opinions. Hmm. It's not the opinion of the passengers or even the pilot, but the data accumulated. So um, that if, if, if you want to know, per, for instance, what food to grow in a particular soil, you bring that soil to the lab 
and that will determine through testing and experimentation what to grow there and then when to to rotate the crops and to what it's not based on opinions or based on a certain advantage of a very few people because they they would acquire more money this is how our decisions are made today but doesn't someone need to run that lab who decides who gets into that lab what level of qualifications who decides which person's opinion we accept as the one that we're now going to use well those that have a background and have passed certain tests certain qualifications been um been approved from other people who are in that field but it's not a matter of people don't get a claim or or nobel prizes for certain positions they do it because they really care about one another and and the earth and um they don't get more money because of it they're not um there's no kind of judgment or admiration for certain people because they have money because there is no money so you don't pay off what you know or what you can get done so it's it's really people who care about the whole process I forgot where I was going to go with that mm, <laughs> but you're kind of saying yeah. we get the brightest and the best yeah. and they're, oh, they're, they're I know what I was going to say with their that. level determines their impact. yes and if there's a dispute about well you know, I have this design for a plane or a transportation unit, and that somebody says, well, I have this design. You put resources to both, and you figure out through statistical data which mm -hmm. is best. And you might choose one now, but you might, when things change and, and materials become updated and different new things are learned, you might change that. So is this sort of decision by committee then, in a way? Like teams, like you have these volunteer teams now, is that the way? you envision things being dis decided in the future? Well, those who are more knowledgeable in the field. And yes, teamwork is better than somebody dictating what happens, mm -hmm. unless there's one person that has more experience than somebody else in the job that needs to be done. Yeah, so I, I like this because it really what you're saying is we do what makes sense. We, we, we listen to the guidance of those who are the most versed in the subject. and We don't go out, it's not a democracy. We don't go say, what's your opinion, what's your opinion? It's really, what do you know? Mm -hmm. and, and what do you base that knowledge on? What, what did you study? What did you, where, where is this um, statement coming from? Can you back it up? 